Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dragon Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And I know a lot of you have told me that I should really do Halloween for October, but... You know, 10 reviews in 31 days? I've already learned why that's not a good idea, but never mind that. I do have a plan for October anyway, as of course it is the month of monsters, scares, Halloween, candy, the Day of the Dead, and the Oktoberfest. But that's not the point. The point is, with four weeks in October, there are plenty of horror series that have four movies in them, such as Pumpkinhead. A 1988 horror film, the directorial debut of special effects wizard Stan Winston. Of course, knowing how to work with latex doesn't necessarily mean you know what good camera angles are, but that's not the point. Pumpkinhead revolves around the events leading up to the resurrection of a supernatural entity known as Pumpkinhead, a demon of vengeance. It stalks and kills those who have wronged the summoner. It also claims the summoner's soul, so they've got to be really certain they want to do it. Which means the whole movie does have a very strong supernatural bent to it, which can work if done right. So, let's take a look at Pumpkinhead and see how a makeup master might manifest magical murder. The movie opens to find the credits are on fire! And then it jumps back to 1957, where we see the Harley family locking up their home for the night. However, it's stranger than you might think. They seem calm enough, but are acting like there's something extremely dangerous close by. Tom Harley! Open up, Tom! It's me, Clayton Heller! Tom! Well, last time, Clayton, we didn't want your vacuum cleaners before, and we don't want them now. Rather, Clayton Heller, played by Dick Warlock, Wow, that's one hell of a name. Uh, anyway, he begs Tom Harley, played by Lee D. Bro, to grant him asylum because a terrible demon is after him. Of course, as the demon is after him and not the Harley family, Tom ignores his cries and leaves him to his fate, witnessed by no one but Tom's son, Eddie, played by Chance Michael Corbett. A sight so terrifying it makes Ed instantly grow up, turning into Lance Henriksen. Or the movie just fast forwards to the present, 1988. Gotta remember to mention the years of all the movies that take place in the present from three decades ago. Eddie's grown up but still lives out in the sticks and has his own son, Billy, played by Matthew Hurley. This opening is just to establish they're a happy family and even have a dog, Gypsy, played by Mushroom, who you might recognize from Gremlins. Oh, and one more thing to establish. I made you a present. You did? I like presents. Oh, well. Now this is something. Context. Context! What the hell kind of present is this? The one that Ed loves and promises to never take off. No bother, he can take this opportunity to tell his son a story. You know it's gonna be a good one with a big body count because it starts out with a truckload of teenagers showing up. Oh, wait, that's just what's happening. Okay, well this introduces is too many to rattle right now, so let's just stick to the two in the sports car, Kim and Joel, played by Kim Ross and John Diacchino. Why do you always have to carry that stupid rifle with you? Because you never know what you're gonna find in the jungle, yo. And uh, Summer Sylvester Stallone was last year. And just throwing this out there, if you just want to be safe, you know, it's a lot easier to carry a handgun. The truck, however, houses the other two girls, Maggie, the religious one, played by Carrie Remsen, and Tracy, the girl next door, played by Cynthia Bain. You've also got your average 80s dude Steve, played by Joel Hoffman, and finally the quasi-geek Chris, played by Jeff East. The characters all meet up thanks to the fact that Ed runs a shop on the road where the teens just so happen to be stopping by. Not necessarily to shop, though. Come on, I thought we were going to get everyone settled in first. Listen. If you want to stay here and play with the vegetables, that's fine with me. I'm going. It's like actually reaching our destination. It's like pfft, 10 miles down the road. Now, let's just race around on dirt bikes on the main drag right here. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> yeah. Randomly killing the child of Lance Henriksen's character. It's pretty bad. As luck would have it, Ed just left Billy here to watch the storefront while he went and got some feed for one of his customers, and there's no phone here and thus nobody here to help. Especially considering Joel has no desire to offer assistance. The hell do you think you're doing? You stay, I'm fucking. Is that what you want? Hey. It was an accident. I almost hit him myself. Yeah, but I've been drinking. Don't fry me. What the fuck state are you in where a penalty for a DWI is execution? Oh, wait. No, he's right. That's actually the plot of this movie. 
Because when he says fuck it and leaves, the rest of the group thinks they might be able to call for help at the cabin they were supposed to head to in the first place, and they all leave, having no one stay behind to watch Billy except for Steve. So by the time Ed gets back, he finds them out in the field, Billy dying, and Steve being an idiot. Nobody saw him, it was an accident. But can I help? Fuck, man, he responded with an orchestral cue. You're screwed. But they still have a chance to get on his good side by summoning medical aid from the cabin. Did you call for help? Which would spoil the horror movie, so of course they didn't. Joel is so adamant about making sure the kid dies, he cuts the phone line himself. This is because he actually is on probation for another accident, and if the police find out he ran over a kid while under the influence, they'll put him away for a long time. So, best to just take the safer route, like attempted murder! Oh. On for you youngins watching who don't quite know this, in the 80s, landlines in the house, you cut one wire, phone's out for the whole house. Kind of like how with Christmas tree lights, if you get one bad bulb, all the lights are out. At least Christmas tree lights made in the 80s. Now, come to think of it, it makes me wonder how the hell NESs still work. So their happy teen getaway has turned into terror. And the monster hasn't even shown up yet. It will, don't worry. It has no idea how internal bleeding works and decides to take Billy home and wash his face. Strangely enough, that doesn't help. Daddy. Yeah, baby. So does he still feel it's the teens at fault for this, or... Is he going to seek out vengeance against Palmolive? So as far as our big group of teenagers are concerned, they're fine. Steve even shows up to say the dad came, so it's all good! I think everything's gonna be okay. Really? Yes. Did you tell him what happened? I told him it was an accident. And? And he, and he just looked at me. What do you mean he just looked at you? I... I mean there was an orchestral cue, but I, I don't think my character's supposed to know that. The meaning is explained when Ed makes it to the Wallace home and speaks to the man of the house, played by Buck Flower. He's here to deliver the grain, but he'd also like some information about the whereabouts of someone Mr. Wallace might know about. Someone who's been around for a long time and has certain powers. She can't help him. All she can do is take you straight to hell. Shit, have you seen the shit I post online? If I'm going, I may as well get my end of the bargain. The point is Mr. Wallace refuses to help him down this path, but don't worry, his grandson, Bunt, played by Brian Bremer, is more than willing to give Ed directions for the low, low price of ten dollars. He only shows him most of the way, though, because as he puts it, the old witch scares the crap out of him, which leaves Ed alone by the time he meets the lady, Haggis, played by Florence Schaffler. Who are you? Um, you and Harley, I thought. Afraid raising the dead. Within my power. Yeah, I love that. What's the answer? Magic! But fellas, magic's got its limitations. And you gotta be reasonable here. He figures a pile of money might remind her she has the power to raise the dead, but that's still not an option. However, she looks into his heart and finds that there is something else that he wants that she can deliver. Sending him on an errand in a forest slash cemetery slash pumpkin patch, he recovers the husk of something terrifying. What is it? It's what you wanted, Ed Harley. Well, not to be rude or anything, but that sure as hell doesn't look like a PlayStation 4 Pro to me. <sighs> Stan, is there any reason in particular we went with a shot of the knife where you could clearly see it peeing blood on his hand? Uh, well, come to think of it, you weren't actually the editor for this movie, okay. Marcus, the fuck? She also collects blood from Billy, or has the knife bleed on him and collects that. Makes more sense that way, because it's not like Billy's blood would flow so well after being dead so long. And the magical mixture is poured into the PlayStation, causing it to be reborn, growing into a horrifying nightmare creature. <laughs> Which it looks like Ed really enjoys. I think they're trying to show that he is, you know, connected in some way to the creature, but... I'm not sure I want to know exactly which part is connected. By the time Ed comes to, the monster's long gone and he is told to GTFO. On his way back, though, he is still not completely in control, making driving a lot harder than it should be. Oh, and this happens. What'd you do, Daddy? Well, just made a deal with the devil to resurrect a demon and kill a bunch of teenagers. It's okay, though. The body count really needed some help in this movie. 
Don't worry about Haggis lying, though. The kid's still dead, much like the rest of the kids are going to be. Joel's calmed down a bit, only holding them up by gunpoint, and allowing Maggie to walk zombie-like outside. Steve goes to follow and gets her to snap out of her funk, because everything's going to be okay. It's okay. I'm sure the boy's gonna be fine. I'm sure his father's taking care of him. Oh my god, Mr. Demon, we were having a moment. So Steve is ripped apart. Ed suffers another murdergasm, and Maggie runs inside screaming about the devil coming out of the woods and taking Steve. Thus, the men go out to face the danger, while the ladies stay in the cabin and tell her she's crazy. Very full of grist and lotus. Maggie, bless her heart, whatever you saw out there, the it wasn't the Jesus. devil. It was! There is no full. There is! I saw it! And the sheltered ones always overreact the most when the pants come off. Joel and Chris's quest for Steve doesn't turn up much beyond his sweet 80s headband, which is covered in blood. So fuck this shit, time to run back into the cabin for shelter. Oh, Jesus. I can't really hold your reaction against you, Tracy. I have no idea what the fuck reason Chris had to kick in the door of his own cabin like he's raiding the place. Just because they're all on the alert for a devil, though, that doesn't mean a weird noise isn't a reason to run the fuck back outside! Whoa, 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 Marcus, Marcus, slow down on the jumps. I want to know what the hell is going on. Help, help me. Maggie! Okay, 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 so Maggie ran out, Steve came down, Maggie hugged Steve, Steve fell down, Pumpkinhead came down, grabbed Maggie's face, then twisted her head around because he actually grabbed her hair from the back of the head, and then pulled her up onto the roof, while well, everyone else just stood around and gawked at it, which we got to clearly see because we got a bunch of close-ups of all of their faces, because it was really important. Pumpkinhead having its way with Maggie causes Ed to suffer from more supernatural stimulation, which makes the editing even harder to follow. I saw something. I don't know. Just but... stay close, okay? Did Marcus Manton really think that we wanted to cut away from the amazing creature effects so we could watch Lance Henriksen driving while masturbating? No bother, Steve's eyes are still moving, but fuck him, he's dead enough. And the movie explains to us what's been going on with Eddie. Seems his link with the demon is a very strong one, and he's been able to see and experience when Pumpkinhead kills someone. Turns out he didn't want that. What did you think? It'd be easy. Neat and clean and painless. Leaving nothing behind but a great scent of brute. Killing a bunch of kids is one thing, but having to feel responsible for killing a bunch of kids is just too much for poor Ed. And despite the old witch telling him that the demon can't be stopped, he vows to do it himself, no matter what it takes. Gonna take a while, though, so let's see what Pumpkinhead's up to. Sorry, there's a spot on your window. Let me just get it for you. Ah, oh, just a little too much elbow grease. Sorry about that. I, you, you can pick that up. The kitchen's your job anyway. Despite having seen the demon before now and being well prepared for bad shit happening, Kim faints on the spot, leaving Joel to watch over her. Or try and run like hell on his own, but it seems Pumpkinhead has wrecked his bike, and also has those nifty slasher villain teleportation powers. to commemorate the special effects that made the scene a hell of a lot more impressive. Especially when considering at its basest form, it was pretty much just Pumpkinhead walking in like, Hi! Uh, uh, okay, get out of the way, get out of the way, I'm taking this. Bye. Don't worry though, Chris and Tracy are still alive, running around like ninnies with a rifle, and meet back up with Joel. Also, Kim finally woke up! Not best timing on her part, though. Marcus, what are you doing? I know these scenes can be shown a hell of a lot more effectively than this, and I can't blame Stan for everything when what's pissing me off the most is the choppy editing. So the survivors run off screen for a bit, and Lance Henriksen can come by to examine the damages. Walking in the cabin, he finds a recycled clip of Steve's body with Joel's leg still in frame. 
disgusted at Marcus Manton's work, he heads out to end this movie. Thing is, there's still lots of kids alive, and they have to run around town screaming for help. Help that they aren't getting because the whole town doesn't want to interfere and put themselves in Pumpkinhead's crosshairs. They might be killed as well if they dare to help out someone who's been marked. What do you mean, marked? Marked for death. Demon summoned specifically for you. Think of it like Final Destination or Death Note. You really can't get out of this shit. With the demon's arrival, the locals say, fuck it and leave the kids to their fate. However, Lance shows up and fights Pumpkinhead back with his shotgun. Well, that was a lot easier than expected. No, Joel, you don't know if it's dead! It's dead. It being all your hopes and dreams. Also, Mark Pumpkinhead down as a horrible monster who knows how to use guns! You use them to impale your victims Michael Myers style! Or maybe Mike was doing it Pumpkinhead style considering this movie technically came out earlier than Halloween 4. The point is Joel is finally dead and Ed is having more gorgasms. This means Chris and Tracy are the only ones left to run around door to door screaming for help! Which they already know doesn't work. Help! Help! You get to bed like I told you now. They already ran through most of the town doing this, and the inhabitants have told them that in no uncertain terms, nobody's gonna fucking help them! It's like these guys never met Vas Montenegro. But what's this? Bunt actually wants to see about helping them. Not because he's oh so nice, it's more morbid curiosity on his part to find out if the creature is real, or just something parents say to scare their children into being obedient. As such, he slips out the back and meets up with the two teens, telling them he knows somewhere they can go for safety. I figure it's a holy place, so it might not like it here. Come on. Come on. Watch out. You figure. You're entrusting people's lives to a hunch. And I hate to break it to you, but if it actually worked like that in this movie, I have a hunch that Maggie would still be breathing. While here, Bunt takes it upon himself to go over the backstory of the creature. It's a demon of vengeance called Pumpkinhead. They call him that, not because he's got a head like a pumpkin, but because the pumpkin patch is where they summon it from. Point is, if it's been called to kill them, they must have done something pretty fucking awful. Putting two and two together, Chris and Tracy realize that it means that Billy didn't survive the accident. Though survival isn't something that many people can brag about in this movie. I think it's here now. Good plan on that burnt down church. Yeah, maybe try the synagogue next. Just work your way down until you find one that actually works. Dear God, I hope it's not the Scientologists. So they must run, and Pumpkinhead can slowly prance through the church, fucking up the cross, and kicking that whole consecrated grounds protecting people idea in the ass. No bother. While fleeing for their lives, the group happens across one of their motorbikes, still intact. That is, if Chris can get it to start. <laughs> Fucking hell, Pumpkinhead. For a demon of vengeance whose only interest is in murdering people, you sure have an impressive knowledge of mechanics. Thus, they're still fucked. But as he's the last male teen alive and we have to have some kind of couple survive this, Chris is not killed by Pumpkinhead, just toyed with over the course of the next ten minutes. More importantly, Ed catches back up with the group, and he has a plan to take Pumpkinhead down once and for all. Nothing. Send it back to whatever hell it come from. Come on, Eddie. Oakland's not that bad. I got some friends there. With the plan in place, there's nothing left to do but wait for Pumpkinhead to show up and try to kill Tracy. <laughs> Marcus, what have I been telling you? The scenes need to be coherent. The point of it all is Pumpkinhead is here and ready to kill them all. That means that their only hope, Ed, is inebriated by the demonic activity yet again, but a little wobbly walk isn't going to stop him from saving the day. Oh my god. Hurting me hurts the monster. Got it! It's not good enough. <laughs> Let's go back to the flamethrower plan! Crap! It really must be self-inflicted torture. 
Okay, Pumpkinhead, you want to play dirty? Read some fucking BuzzFeed articles. Ed does something a little bit less crazy, though. Seems he has a handy-dandy revolver and knows what he must do to stop the nightmare. I, uh, the Eddie? Normally people aren't walking after doing that. Surprising no one, after he collapses, it turns out he's still not quite dead. Thus, the monster is still not dead, and it's all come down to Tracy, grabbing the revolver and farting around with it long enough for Ed to go demonic as well, making this whole process a lot easier on the moral compass. You know, come to think of it, while Ed was driving and having his demon gasms, if he had gone off the road and hit a tree, this movie would have been a hell of a lot shorter. Never mind all that, happy ending! Pumpkinhead is dead, because Ed is dead. Pumpkinhead also is a gas-powered grill, which is a bit surprising, but the crisis is over. However, we see Haggis back in the Pumpkin Patch Cemetery Forest, burying the husk of Pumpkinhead so that it may be called upon for vengeance once again. <laughs> Which is actually the body of Ed Harley, who is cursed with the worst curse of all! Even after dying, he will be expected to get up and go to work for somebody. Anyway, that was Pumpkinhead. And it is all sorts of what the fuck. The concept is simple, so it's kind of hard to knock the second half of the movie for being simplistic. Rather, the problem I have is that a lot of the presentation feels unbalanced. The first half goes to great lengths to go over Ed and his family, while spending minimal amounts of time establishing the other characters. By the time Pumpkinhead starts walking around, the movie feels like it's devolved into a more basic slasher flick, but I think that's just because Ed, the most fleshed out character, has very little screen time after that. My biggest issue with the film has to be the editing. Dear God, what in the hell was going on with the editing? Yes, with practical creature effects, you have to get creative with your cuts if you want it to look good, and indeed with CGI, but people forget that. But the way this movie cuts from character to character and scene to scene makes it very hard to follow at times. On the plus side, the story is actually intriguing for what amounts to a monster flick. The backstory of the creature is given plenty of time, its origins are explained in a way that makes sense, and still leaves enough wiggle room that it can have mysterious, frightening qualities. That, and it looks badass. Overall, Pumpkinhead has a hell of a lot of flaws, but also a lot of things going for it. It's both easy to see why it didn't do well on its initial release, and how it's kept a strong following. While there's plenty for me to complain about and things I think could have made it better, it balances to an average horror experience, coming in at three monstrous mechanical masters out of five. But you know, Lance, there would have been no chance for the almost death where you have to rely on someone else to finish you off if you had just done it right the first time, and it's impossible not to do it right the first time if you use something like, I don't know, a wood chipper. Thank you all for watching, I've been Decker Shadow, and remember, never trust magical practitioners whose knives bleed on you. Well, fuck it. Let's just kidnap Chris and Tracy and go to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs>